I'm going to just kick us up for a quick prayer. Lord, thank you, Father, for another chance to come together that we can learn from you and grow in our relationship with you. We love you so much, Lord. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so today, kind of a crazy class, all right? We're in class five. We have one more left, and we're done with book one. Class five now, I call it evidence, but the name of the class is the statistics of Christianity. Don't be scared. Okay? I'm not going to go deep into math and you're going to say, what am I dealing with? I'm going to show you how it's insane not to trust in the God, God of the Bible because of the amount of evidence. So I title this class Evidence. Okay? So what we're going to look at, the statistics of Christianity, this is in your book. We're still talking about the gospel. We're talking about truth and evidence. So again, I, I gotta take, I gotta say another thing about the warm-up we just had. Everything you guys look at should come back to whether it's true or not, conforms to reality. That's a very helpful way to see, see easily why God is real. So we're gonna be looking at how does how does science get involved in searching for truth? How can you tell from something that happened in the past whether or not it's true? And what is this about probabilities? Statistics. You hear Phil, matter of fact, he does this sometimes in service. He'll say, the probabilities of those fulfilled prophecies are so high that we know they must be true. So I want to give you a little background of why he says what he says. Okay, so this is lesson 20, Karen. Thank you. You're welcome. Such a pain. So we have five <coughs> classes we're doing. We've been through the top three. Today we're looking at the statistics of Christianity, okay? Okay, so when we talked about this before, the essentials, remember we made that list that time when we went through, what do we think are the essential things to be Christian, not to grow in Christianity, but to be Christian. And we came up with six things, and in this class we're zeroing in when we talk about evidence on three of them. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute in your book. But if you're in your book and you're wondering where we are, this one is page 71. We're, at, we're starting chapter 4. We're at lesson 4.1, um, applying science to search for truth. Believe it or not, science and the scientific method is exactly what we can use to help validate and verify the truth of Christianity. Now, how many times are you told that the two are opposing points of view? Right? Because your faith is all about feelings. Right? In science, it's about facts and reasoning, and, you know, they can't match. So let's take a look. So you've got something going on called observable science. This is what, very, very important, this is what kids learn in school. Um, <coughs> observable science means you're studying how present events happen, um, you're studying testable, repeatable, observable events. So these are things you can do right in front of your eyes and run them. Data is being collected during the event, so it's direct evidence. You can recreate and retest the events to, to, uh, so your conclusions can be proven false. I gave you an example once with my son, Landon, claiming he has a much higher percentage in basketball shooting from the foul line than anywhere else on the court, right? So can I set up a test to see if that claim is true? Sure. <laughs> so what we did. So we did 10 shots, one at the foul line, one in each corner, one at the top of the key, different places, and we proved he's pretty much right. But And we could observe it and watch it, we could record data, we could see it. And you know what? If we weren't sure, we could repeat it and do it over and over again. So this is called observable science. Make sense? This is what it looks like. This is what you learn in school. This is really important, and non-believers confuse us all the time, just try to trip you up. Well, you know, Christianity isn't scientific. It doesn't follow the scientific method, you know, and um, so therefore, you know, there's nothing, it's, it's just a bunch of wishful thinking, and you can't trust it. So you have this, this method you use. Somebody, defines a problem, you know, we've got this problem. I, this is what I do at work for a living. 
Um, I gave you an example before where a uh, CFO comes to me and says, if we don't start getting our, our clean bill in front of a client in 15 days, we don't get paid for two months. So the problem is I can't get a bill that, from the work that we've done for them in front of the client to pay us within 15 days. So what we do is we gather the relevant data. Okay, so do we have data out there? Sure, okay, I'll go back. I look for the last three to six months. Thousands of bills have been tried to be sent, but never in 15 days. So first I validate what he said. I said, yeah, you're averaging 72 days. You're right, you know, we, we're in big trouble here. Then you formulate a hypothesis. In other words, why is it the way it is? Why isn't a bill getting there in 15 days? And people start telling me reasons. So what do you think we do with it? We start running tests and we either can confirm or conflict with the hypothesis that was made. Well, the claim is, uh, we have untrained people in the West Coast office who don't know how to do a bill, so they're averaging this much time. Okay, let's go study these people, let's see if they can train correctly, blah, blah, blah. Is it true or not? You know, so there's, there's things you can do. If it turns out that you can go ahead and confirm the hypothesis that's made, you then can present it and say, okay, I'm presenting to you what I think is the theory that supports the claim. And hopefully the data you present, the observations will confirm what you said. Then you have a peer review. You get a group of experts there and you go through it with them and if the peer review accepts it, guess what happens? It's pr pretty much <coughs> exact. An obvious example is the law of gravity. Is there a chance that uh, when you drop a ball, it might not fall to the ground? Is there a chance? that could happen. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> There's a chance. Why do we believe the ball will always fall to the ground? It's been proven over and over. We've never seen it not. <laughs> We've had billions of tests and we're to the point now where we're saying we're comfortable by peer review to saying this theory is a law, right? Something wacky could happen. Who knows? A planet hits another planet out there, turns things, something could happen. But we're sitting there going, no, we can actually define it with an equation. We can actually write an equation that says how gravity works. Do you know nobody can define gravity? Gravity, it's impossible. They can describe it, they can't define it. Nobody knows what it is. We can describe it with an equation. Do you know um, one of the most famous debates and John Lennox does with atheists is uh, he tries to get them to define energy, and it's undefinable. We can just describe it. So there's a lot of things in life we can describe, but we can't define. This is a method for us to test so we can get a sense of, in terms of probability, if it's true or not. So, so far, so good? So it wouldn't be able to be tested by a mathematical equation by meaning definition. Um, no, you can. If I collected enough data, right, I could use formula, I could use algorithms, I could use different things to see if it conforms to an equation. Right. But gravity, you can't define it because of what? Is it because there's no mathematical formula? I know there is mathematical formula to use to get probability, but why then can't you define it? Well, if I sit here and I say gravity equals g, and it's going to be the distance squared right minus that that mass the difference in the mass I just described it mm -hmm. but what is it is it a wavelength is it a particle is it a um, heat heat wave is it a sonic wave or system so it can only be broke down so far in other words I can describe it we call it a force right you realize now we've discovered since uh, general theory of relativity it's not a force. What it is, it's actually a phenomenon that bends, it actually bends around objects and that's how we got uh, the relative. Isn't it related to mass? Well that's, yes, yeah, that's mass, right? right? Yeah. So yeah, we can describe it, but when we try to define it, right, it's really hard. 
There are some things we can define. We can define dirt. We can break it down into its elements. And then you can go on a periodic table and define nitrogen, because we can go all the way down to the number of protons and electrons. And we can break it all down and define what dirt is. Can't do that with energy. We can't do it with gravity. So we can only describe it. This is the same with God. You can't define it. And people will struggle because they can't define it. Right? And that's when we talk about faith. It's like, so what? I can define a, a jet engine and I can tell you exactly if certain things go wrong that people die because I understand every little part in a jet engine and that's what I did for a living for a while. I can't define, um, I can't define uh, accounting. I can't define a lot of things. I don't know a lot of things. Some of the most basic things in existence here, we can only describe them, we can't define them. And God says that's what he's like too. So. We have the scientific method that you can use with observable science, things you can observe. What about what we would call historical? These are things we haven't observed. This is studying how, how past events happen. You have, you're studying untestable, non-repeatable, unobservable events. Data is being collected after the event, so it's circumstantial, it's not direct. And you can't recreate that event, so conclusions can't be proven false. What do you think is going on in a court of law in a murder case? There's no absolute or <laughs> based on evidence. Yeah. I mean, I'm, when I'm on the jury, we're not going to recreate the murder, right? Something happened in the past. You got a bunch of data. When you look at all that data, what do you think happened? Unless there's a video. Even with a video. How do you know the video's right? Because it's not a direct observation. Videos have been shown to be false before. So what you do with that information is you do what? You infer. You infer from the information based on the likelihood or trustworthiness of the data. Am I making sense? <clears throat> this is why evolution is so crazy to be taught as science. <laughs> Look at the scientific method. Somebody comes in and says, I got a hypothesis, a two-chambered heart of a fish evolved over time to a four-chambered heart of a human. Really? How does that happen? We don't know, it just does. But wait a minute, can we test it in a lab? No, I can't run any experiment that shows a two-chambered fish heart going to a three-chambered amphibian heart to a four-chambered uh, human heart, but by gradual change over billions of years with genetic mutations that happens. And it's like, dude, that's not science. That's <laughs> philosophy. So I can't test it. I'm going to show you why today when we talk about Genesis 1-1, it's testable. Okay, even though it's a past event. So bear with me. Did you want to? I was just saying, I read uh, Bill Nye's book undeniable and he complains about this you know like Christians trying to separate the three sciences but then it's interesting when you read you know, later on he actually creates this distinction he starts talking about lava flows and how we can't know everything yes and so he ends up say, you know basically saying there is this distinction but he doesn't like it when like Christians now I'm sorry what's your first name again? Brandon Brandon thank you yes this is what I mean about having your radar up just being aware, listening to what people are saying. This is very straightforward right here. Historical events type data is used all the time, our entire legal system. CSI, a lot of things are based on it. So for him to say you can't use it, first of all, that's a warning signal. Say, wait a minute, I use it all the time. Secondly, when he turns around and uses it, then you know right away there's a bias. So, <clears throat> How is it used today? CSI, legal system, business analytics, I use it all the time. Moneyball, I'm gonna show this, this video real quick. Anybody know what Moneyball is, right? The stock market uses it all the time, right? So let's watch this quick video. This is where they started using statistics 
in baseball? There are rich teams and there are poor teams. Then there's 50 feet of crap. And then there's us. We got to think different. Moneyball, the new film from Sony Pictures details the Oakland A's success using a new approach to statistics. But how did that way of thinking get started? The seed was planted, oddly enough, by an aspiring writer in Kansas working nights at a pork and beans cannery. I actually had four jobs. I was working as a night watchman. I was working at flipping hamburgers. I was working at a convenience store. And I was in the middle of a teaching. That's Johnson Community College. The only thing I knew was baseball, so I started writing on baseball. You're discounting what scouts have done for 150 years? We're going to shake things up. Bill James started writing about the valuation of baseball players using regressions analysis. I spent a long time trying to predict how many runs a team would score. And given how many runs they score and how many games they win, it seems impossibly simple now, but that was all it was. At the time, nobody else knew. Nobody was counting it. In 1977, James compiled all these numbers into 68 pages and started making photocopies. He took out a tiny ad in the Sporting News, and the baseball abstract was born. So the first book sold about 75 copies. The second one was sold about 300, and the third one 400. It was baseball hobbyists. And people who had quantitative ability but had no connection to the game, who were generating all this new possession of baseball knowledge. There's a runner on second, and no one out, and a ground ball is supposed to be shortstop. The right play is to be aggressive and try to make it third. And I had written about it, and all of a sudden I realized the Oakland A's were doing it. That was actually the first clue I had that these people may be paying attention to what we're doing. Bill James' way of analyzing baseball was finally beginning to take hold in the major leagues, led by a progressive front office in the East Bay that would soon take the American League by storm. So what what kind of science is he applying? Or historical. He's using past data. He's using data he's collected over years. And he's saying, you know what? The data says if you're on second, there's a ground ball or shortstop, go to third. He's not observing it and seeing what happens. He's doing analysis called regression analysis to see what's the confidence and certainty of someone making it to third when the ball's hit second. Is that cool? So you can use Bill Nye's wrong. We do it all the time. We do it in many, many places. Right? So how do we use it when it comes to Christianity? I can look at the origin of the universe. I can look at the origin of life, the reliability of the Bible. I can look at God's existence, the person of Christ. In your book, page uh, 74, is the Bible reliable? I give you 53 measurable circumstantial data points. 53 that you can study. On, um, I'm, on uh, Jesus Christ, is he Messiah? Page 75, I give you 87 data points that you can actually measure on, and that they go for page after page. On the origin of life, is the universe specially created? I give you 60 data points starting on page 78. Each one of these you could go through and study, and I give you the Bible verse that links to it. Is that not insane? So in terms of data, there's a ton of it. So if you realize, if you realize that, um, you know, that's kind of funny, I'll tell you, that's the CFO of Black and Beach asking me to do statistical analysis on historical data so they can set their budget for next year. <laughs> I'm doing it right now with them to figure out what's the risk or likelihood of us making the money we're gonna make based on historical analysis. We do it all the time. And yet we won't do it with the Bible. It's wonderful. I think this is the greatest thing about the Bible. You know what God literally says, why he gets so upset in Romans chapter 1? You know why I have wrath against you? Because I give you these things, and you ignore them. You don't just ignore them, you suppress it. You actually fight me against it. I told you in Genesis 1 morning, the universe came from nothing. There's all this evidence, and you sit there and you say, screw you, God, that's not true, because I believe otherwise. And God's saying, you know, that really makes me bored when I give you this. So he gives it to us, you know why? So we can be excited and confident with them when Jesus says that he's always with us during this life, he's always there for us, he cares about us, he knows us personally, and he can't wait to see us one day when we die. We can believe him. 
You can trust it. All right, give me an example. How would you apply this? All right, so you got this surfboard, it's got a big bite out of it, right? And uh, we've got uh, in the Tribune in uh, Santa Barbara on the 23rd of October, it said, the shark that fatally attacked a man has been identified as a 15 to 16 foot great white, according to the sheriff's office. Okay? Now, how do they know if nobody saw the shark? <laughs> how do they know? So we come on and we say, okay, first we have forensics. Um, they examined the body, they recovered the body. Uh, the injuries that he sustained were very, very much like that you get from a shark versus anything else. Uh, the teeth pattern and the size fit the mouth pattern perfectly of a great white of a certain age. Circumstantial, what's the chance of a great white shark attack happening off the coast of Northern California? Very high. Um, what's the chance of it being found in these waters? Very high. Corroborating evidence. If I put all the circumstantial evidence together, is it convincing enough to make a re to make reasonable uh, co conclusion? In this case, yeah. Each one by itself may not be, but when you put it all together, is it reasonable for the coroner's office to go ahead and publish in the paper this statement? They think so. Right? So I just gave you 60 evidences alone. That's only 60 for the origin of the universe if it's the Bible. 87 for Christ as God. Another 53 for the reliability of the Bible. You, you see how corroborating-wise things just keep piling up? So is it not reasonable <laughs> to think that what we're seeing in real life, how well it aligns with the Bible, that you believe it? I don't know. Maybe it just, just makes sense to you guys. This is what's incredible. God is not a God who's a touchy-feely God only and says, you know, like uh, like the uh, Harry Krishna or uh, a lot of the uh, Hindu literature that says, you know, just just trust in me without uh, using your brain and, you know, life will be wonderful and all that. God's like, no, no, no. Come, let us reason together in, in Isaiah, right? Many infallible proofs in the book of Acts. God is saying, pay attention to this stuff. When you see this, you know that I'm real. So the answer to that, of course, is yes. People would look at this and say, yeah, that's definitely a reasonable conclusion. We had a great white shark attack. So I'm gonna run you through, and we'll have a few videos too, so you won't be too bored. I'm just gonna run you through types of things we do with statistics that really help us. Because these are very much used to gain confidence in your Christian worldview. Okay, first one. Um, when you're driving down the street and you see that, what are you thinking right away? There's limits. Agreed? Driving down the road, probably if you come across a sign, the first thing you do is take a quick look at your speedometer, and then you feel comfortable, right? Why is that? Why do you do that? Yeah, because you believe there's a reason for this or some kind of law. Nobody looks at it and goes, that it doesn't apply to me. Everybody looks at it and thinks, right? And then, you know, how do they collect data to see whether or not people are obeying that, right? So it's not like someone could say, um, well, I'm sure I'm gonna use a scientific method. The scientific method is I have limits of 40 miles an hour to 70, and I'll make a claim. Nobody goes outside of those limits. The first question someone should ask is, how do you know? This is how they find out, right? So they collect data. He collects 2,500 readings of people over two years as they're driving through to characterize what these speeds are. And then he comes up with this. Don't worry, I won't get into the definitions and everything, but this is called a histogram or a bell curve. It's recording speeds. Uh, he sets the limits. That red dotted line on the left is the lower limit, 40. The red one to the right is the upper limit, 70. <clears throat> Any vertical bar on the outside means somebody was either going too slow or too fast. Now we can build it together and we can see on the left, I have defect number one going too slow. It turns out 
that 6.2% of those 2,500 people driving on that highway were going under 40 miles an hour. Defect number two, going too fast, 10.4% were going over 70. I just add the two together. So now I have 16.6%. .6%. Now I can check the claim. Somebody said nobody ever violates a speed law. Say, no, actually now your hypothesis is false. I collect the data and it looks to me like one out of every six autos is going too fast or too slow. This is historical data. He may have been recording it, but I didn't investigate it till later. I came back and built this and I said, here's a better claim. You can expect one out of every six people on that highway to violate the speed limit. You know how they use this data usually? To generate revenue? Oh, you use a revenue. Yeah, <laughs> to go pay attention. <laughs> if you have one where 90% of the people violate the speed limit, Chances are you're going to go pay close, closer attention to that road versus another. This is how statistics are used with historical data. How can we use it? Um, well, you want to predict the behavior of a process to see whether or not it's behaving as you thought. And, and mathematics, statistics is a great way to do it. This was Bill James at KU who started Moneyball, the Moneyball phenomenon. He was looking at if a ball is hit to, to shortstop, what's the defect rate of people making it to third? Mm. He does that historical analysis and he goes, son of a gun, 82% of people, when they're on second base, they make it. So what's the risk of a manager to not allowing someone to try to go to third on a short, to hit the shortstop? The risk is kind of low, it's only 18%. It's worth taking, the risk is worth taking because such a high percentage make it. Make sense? Mm -hmm. What do we mean by this thing Six Sigma? Um, give you an idea. Um, this is a term we use. You have an up and lower spec. We just talked about 40 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour. If you have something that's called 3.8, all it means is 99% of the time it doesn't, it, it doesn't fail. It's within the limits. When we say Six Sigma, what we're saying is It almost never fails. So with a Six Sigma process, you get three defects in every million, okay? So a good process, if somebody tells you it's 99% good, sounds, that sounds really good. If it's this high, that we, we call it the term is Six Sigma, it almost never fails. Keep in mind, three defects in a million, okay? This is, this is, this is what I do for a living, is to try to drive processes as much as you can towards that to be very repeatable. And you can use this if you want to evaluate the operating <coughs> ability of any process, including the universe. But they're not teaching this in school. I'll give you an example. All right, a process that's 99% good, mail delivery, you'd lose 20,000 articles in an hour. Drinking water, you'd have unsafe drinking water in a major city every 15 minutes each day, or for 15 minutes in a day. Hospital surgery in a major city, 5,000 incorrect procedures every week. <laughs> Air travel, two abnormal landings in the US at most airports every day. This is 99% good. Drink, drug prescription in the U.S., 200,000 wrong prescriptions every year. Does that sound good? That's a 99% process. The higher the sample, the more likely you're going to have an error. Because remember, for every thousand, there's one wrong. So as you're doing more and more, those numbers are going to get bigger. Still 99%. The good news is most of those lost articles are junk mail. There you go. Here's a claim he's making. Now, how can we test that? <laughs> Pretty easy. All right. All right, let's look at 99%. Six Sigma process, mail delivery, seven lost articles per hour instead of 20,000. Drinking water, only two minutes in a year instead of 15 minutes every day. Hospital surgery, only two incorrect instead of 5,000 every week. Air travel, 
Only one abnormal landing every five years instead of two every day. Drug prescriptions, 68 long instead of 200,000. So you see the difference? So my question to you is, when improvements are made, <coughs> you see a, a process operating that well, do you think it happened by chance? Or do you think there's an intelligence behind it? What do you think? Intelligence. Intelligence. How can you get, how can you improve from two abnormal landings at an airport every day to only one every five years by chance? <laughs> how, how is it possible to have that level of accuracy on landings by chance. You know how many things can go wrong with flights and aircraft? So there's something behind the scenes you can't see that's been designed. You get what I'm saying? So don't you intuitively know? Wouldn't you say that? It's intuitive that something like this would have to be caused. So you think we're just lucky when we look at these prophecies in the Old Testament for the way historically they've come true that they just happen to fall that way? Or that the precision you see in the universe is just lucky? See, we'll accept it for some things, but we won't for others. We better have a design system for safe landings um, what do you think is the, uh, if six sigma means one, three failures for a million for uh, landings at an airport, what do you think is the sigma level for luggage? For your <laughs> luggage being, uh, so you know right away, don't you? You know right away. Why, why would the sigma level for luggage, be, getting your luggage back, not be as good as safe landings? More variables involved. More variables. Well, I think safe landing, there's there's millions the, of parts in a jet aircraft that if it went wrong would cause an unsafe landing. The risk. There's a high risk. I'll tell you what it is. There's a lot more design that goes into a safe landing than in making sure your luggage arrives safely. You don't they don't hire a bunch of people to work on making sure your luggage is there. Right? The way they mitigate the risk is they say, okay, uh, to your point. What's the impact if it goes wrong? If a plane crashes because it's unsafe with 200 people on it, that's a lot bigger of an impact than if I lose somebody's luggage. So therefore, I'm willing to take the risk of losing luggage because the effect on me as a company is a lot lower. So I design more into a safe landing and I spend more money, but I don't do that for people's luggage. Right? Now they would if people paid them for it. If somebody can and say, I'm willing to pay you $10 million to make sure luggage arrives safely in the Denver airport, I guarantee you they would spend money on it because they get a return for it. So this is what it's all about. So when you, again, look at the universe. And well, then, how many, how many, uh, how many signals out is it for a healthy baby to be born from right. conception to birth? Right. It'd probably be 20 signals. Right, when you look at just the phenomenon that we look at is, as how on earth do babies be born like they're born if it was just totally random without any process in place for a child to be delivered? How about, um, and we're gonna get into this in book two, how about blood clotting when you bleed? You cut yourself. Why is it you always form a scab? Why? What is that that you always are protected? Okay. Here's another one. We call this irreducible complexity. It's when you have a system where every piece is critical because all it takes is one to be wrong and the whole system falls apart. So my job at, um, when I was at my former company is I ran a jet engine facility. We had to tear them down, rebuild them, and give them back to the client. So in a jet engine, there's like five major components. There's a fan, low pressure cases that contain all the blades, your high pressure cases, a low pressure turbine, 
a high pressure turbine, and then the final assembly. Okay, so the way this works is if I collect data and I find that the guys in the shop 80% of the time do the fan assembly correctly, they do the low pressure at 90, the high pressure at 90, the low turbine at 90, the high pressure turbine assembly at 60, and the, the final engine assembly at 80% good. What's the chance that I'm gonna deliver an engine that works to the client? Here's how you figure it out. 24%. Yes, 28%. You multiply them together, this is irreducible complexity. <clears throat> If any one of those pieces isn't 100% or isn't perfect, the whole system falls down. So I only have a 28% chance of making a working jet engine. <laughs> so my question is, uh, a big client I had at that facility was the US military. You think they'd hire me if I came to them with data and said, you got about a one in four shot of getting, getting your uh, engine back to your jet. And yet we can measure in biochemistry, how kinesin works, we can look at how ATP is formed within the mitochondria. We can look at how RNA, messenger RNA, transcripts information off of DNA. It does it perfect almost every time, and it actually has an error spell checker in it, that if it does it wrong, it catches it and fixes it. How the heck is that? Where's that coming from? See what I'm saying? So this is irreducible complexity. Let's watch this little video. This is kind of a quick one. <laughs> this is coming out of Harvard. <laughs> lesson is that on that video don't do that to me that lesson 21 <laughs> 21 so we're in lessons 20 to 23 I think with this class but that's 21 this one accuracy with precision I want to show you this this is a huge thing to remember if you can that really points to a designer um, does that make sense everybody knows that that if you think the average of the X is from the center you get a you get accuracy Accuracy with precision is when you get both. Now, in the world of statistics and probability science, you can get accuracy in nature on, on random events, but you never, in an operating system, get accuracy and precision without intelligence. 
okay? You can't get that. So when you see it in biochemistry or when you see it in the universe, it can't happen, happen randomly. And we can use this when we examine things, which we're going to be examining in book two. So, let's take a look at this. If you just look at it, this is, um, we've been going through pages 80, this is on page 83. If you just look at from the smallest particles on a cell down to like even uh, a quark, protons, neutrons, all the way up to the overall universe, it's filled with variables that are incredibly precise and accurate. And if they weren't, life couldn't exist. Uh, Werner von Braun, he's one of those guys on the list of scientists, said, to be forced to believe only one conclusion, that everything in the universe happened by chance, would violate the very objectivity of science itself. What random process could produce the brains of a man or the system of a human eye? In other words, he's saying this is insane that people would actually accept what we're being taught. Fred Hoyle became a deist. He was a very staunch atheist when he studied the carbon atom and its precision. And he said this, the probability of life originating at random is so utterly minuscule as to make it absurd. The favorable properties of physics on which life depends are in every respect deliberate. It is therefore almost inevitable that our own measure of intelligence must reflect higher intelligences, even to the limit of God. Such a theory is so obvious, so obvious, that one wonders why it is not widely accepted as being self-evident. The reasons are psychological rather than scientific. So he's saying, people like Bill Nye, the reasons they reject it are psychological, not scientific. This is a guy, staunch atheist, who said, just look at the evidence. I can't be an atheist anymore, it's not possible. Probability of a cell evolving, why don't we watch this one? <laughs> So what is the probability of a simple cell evolving by undirected natural processes? The probability of a single protein being formed by undirected natural processes is only 1 in 10 to the 164th power. That's 10 with 164 zeros following it. That's pretty big. The probability of life, a simple cell evolving by undirected natural processes, is 1 in 10 to the 340 million power. That is unimaginable. Here's an illustration to help demonstrate just what this means. Here we have one tiny grain of sand. It's been estimated that there are 1 million grains of sand in a half a cup. It would take 1 million half cups of sand to fill a swimming pool that's 6 feet deep and 30 feet in diameter. Now, if we took one billion of these pools of sand, we could fill Lake Tahoe in Nevada, which is about 22 miles long and 12 miles wide. Think you could find that original grain of sand we started with? We're not done yet. It would take about one billion Lake Tahoes to fill the volume of the Earth with sand. The probability of grabbing that original grain of sand out of the Earth filled with sand is 1 in 10 to the 30th power. It would take 100 million Earths to fill one sun with sand, and 1 trillion suns to fill our solar system, 10 trillion solar systems to fill one cubic light year, 100 trillion cubic light years to fill the volume of the Milky Way galaxy, and finally 10 billion Milky Way galaxies to fill the observable universe. Whew. That is a lot of sand. The probability of now randomly picking our original grain of sand from the entire observable universe is 1 in 10 to the 96th power. Still a far cry from our protein being formed at 1 in 10 to the 164th power, and even less chance of life evolving from undirected natural processes at the probability of 1 in 10 to the 340 millionth power. Starting to get the idea? Scientists generally consider anything with a probability of less than 1 part in 10 to the 70th power operationally impossible. And by the way, that calculation doesn't take into consideration the information that's stored in the cell, which directs the cell in all aspects of operation. That estimate is solely the chance of chemicals combining to form something living. So 
the chance of life evolving and retaining the information needed to replicate itself is astronomically smaller than anything we know. And that's only one organism. Think about what it would mean for millions of complex organisms to have evolved from an undirected natural process. According to information science, the probability is so small that it's deemed operationally impossible. So, knowing all of this, should the popular scenarios of chemical and biological evolution be taught globally as the only explanation of the origin of life and species? It's my belief that we're not opening our minds to the possibility of other explanations. Now, one of the most basic concepts you should have learned is that if observations and data contradict the theory you're testing, then the theory should be modified or abandoned. Unfortunately, this doesn't seem to be happening to the present most popular model of origins. Instead, many scientists are trying to take information and make it fit the evolutionary models. But is that good science? Critical thinking is required to realize the information science aspects of this and to make sure that whatever scenarios you're coming up with do not violate the principles of information science. Too often, scientists, they believe that information can be generated by physical processes and that simply is not true. Functional information cannot be generated from purely physical properties. Sigmund Freud once said, from error to error, one discovers the entire truth. As we examine history, we are constantly reminded of our ever-evolving thoughts in science. We look at the ideas of the Earth being flat, or being the center of the universe, or the cell being the simplest component of life. And while these theories seemed promising at the time, we have discovered they are completely incorrect. As we learn more about this amazing world in which we live, we start to understand the complexity of its workings. And in the case of the cell, the more we research, the more complex it seems to be. As we gather information, it is up to us as scientists, students, and colleagues to bring science to a level of integrity and critical examination that it deserves. If we approach science with an unsupported prearranged bias, then what we're trying to accomplish is not really science at all. The beauty of science is that we're able to move away from accepted dogma to examine the evidences. It's not up to us to disprove a given theory. It's up to the theory to prove itself against the laws of science. If the theory fails to do this, then it should be rejected, and we should search for more knowledge in order to, as Sigmund Freud said, discover the entire truth. The possibility of life evolving using the known laws of chemistry and physics is operationally impossible. When we consider the laws of information, that possibility now becomes impossible. Meaningful prescriptive information cannot arise from nothing no matter how much time you allow. And until we acknowledge this, we will never discover the origin of life. Thank you for joining me on this amazing journey through science and the programming of life. I would challenge you to examine the evidences and join the growing community of critical thinkers. Until next time. See, the reality is we're the critical thinkers. Yeah, the culture's not gonna let you think that way, are they? See, we're, we're uh, faith-based without using any logic. The reality is, God says it all the time throughout the Old Testament and New Testament that just take a look, just pay attention. Can't you see that it's me? What power of 10 does it is considered impossible? Now, he said 70. Uh, okay, I didn't hear It's this. usually 50 to 58, okay. somewhere around that. But this is so far beyond that. It's just silly, right? It'd be like me saying, all right, guys, I did some calculations based on the amount of flights that happen around the area, and you know, there's about a one in one in 22 one, one in 22 chance a um, jet a jet uh, an aircraft is going to hit this room uh, this morning. All right, I don't see anybody running, right? Nobody's running because they're they're sitting there going, "Why? Why don't you think? Why doesn't that worry you?" 
Because the probabilities of it happen, happening are so small, it doesn't bother you. But what did you do? You based your behavior on that, which is logical. And yet you have this. And yet people don't want to base their behavior on it. In other yep. words, the God who says these things, with the evidence that backs up what he says, then has expectations on your life. And it's not about whether you like him or not. It's about whether he's real and exists. <laughs> the evidence strongly, strongly leans to where it's almost impossible that he doesn't exist. So therefore, <clears throat> why wouldn't you believe? It can't be the evidence. This has to be something else. Just like with a jet crashing into this room. Because it's all about behavior, isn't it? Okay, so I think I think what we'll do is, uh, you don't know this, but I'll tell you, I go in tomorrow, I'm getting my hip replaced. Mm -hmm. I go in for a hip replacement. Mm -hmm. I bet by next Sunday, it's gonna be hard for me to get in here. So Kevin and I are gonna finish this out, and he'll come in, he'll show the video, and you guys can then talk through the class. I feel pretty good I'll be back the week after. I'm not certain, but I think the probabilities are high enough that I'll be okay, okay? <laughs> So this is, believe it or not, when I talk statistics, I'm trying to do it at a level that makes sense. Is this helpful, what we learned today? Is this kind of, this is the way things work. And God in the Bible, when he says things like, the wrath of God is against all ungodliness, godlessness, and unrighteousness, right? For those he says that suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So he's not mad or upset at people that don't believe. He's, he's, he's wrathful and angry at people that see the evidence and yet reject it. And worse than rejecting, they suppress it. So they, like Bill Nye, he's going to take what is obvious and he's gonna twist it to fit what he wants it to say. There's God hates that. Because, why do you think he hates that? Doing the opposite of what he said. Well, yeah, but how come he didn't ask, why wasn't God's wrath against David when he murders um, Uriah to have sex with Bathsheba? Why doesn't it say that God's wrath boiled against David to destroy him? Because what happened was David knew it was wrong. Why did David do it? His flesh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, guys in the room here, we can say, well, not me. If I see a beautiful naked woman and she's, you know, sunning herself out in the sun, my thought is nothing to do with having sex with her. I'm just thinking physically, that's a wonderful work of art. Right? Is that what guys think? <laughs> No, we're lying if we say that, right? <laughs> but what David said was, whoa, I want her, right? He takes her, then he gets himself caught up, and what does he do? He premeditates the murder of Uriah. So it's not like, you know, he says, lucky thing, Uriah's dead, that's, now I'm off the hook. He actually plans it, and yet God still says his wrath is against him. What happens is Nathan comes, like, like you said, right, Lisa? Nathan comes and tells David the story of the king and the servant or one of the, one of the peasants who has a little lamb and says, you know, the, the king decided he wanted the lamb, so he took it and made a stew out of it to eat, even though he knew that little lamb was the only thing that peasant had. And, David, and then Nathan says, so what should we do to that king? Remember what David said? <laughs> Kill him. And David looks at David and goes, well, that's you. <laughs> now, David had a choice to make. He, he could have went, you know who I am. Screw you. Who are you to tell me that? I'm David. I'm king. What did he do instead? It destroyed him, right? It says, read Psalm 32, read Psalm 51. It destroyed him because even though he did what he did, when he was confronted, he didn't suppress it, right? It's amazing the things we do. 
like, okay, Lauren Daigle says that, our first thought is, well, she's a jerk, or who she thinks she is. She's, she's not on the Ellen DeGeneres show, she's in public, she's millions of people who love her, and she says that. How many in here have ever been in a situation where you, you have all these people around you, and something said, and you tell a half truth because, or you say something different because you don't want to offend anyone? We do it all the time, right? It's not any different. You know what God does with those? Mercy. He does that. He, he comes in, he convicts your heart. He convicts what you said. He brings people to, to bring it to your attention. What you do with that is what matters. And that's because God says what's most important about a person isn't what they do. God doesn't care what you do. He cares who you are. Matter of fact, it's even worse. He cares who you become. He wants you to become who he intended you to be when he gave life to you. And we struggle because we're so sinful. <laughs> we, we're not paying attention to what God is trying to do to bring us to where he wants us to be. Instead, we're involved in all the things that he's saying is wasting our time. So when I give you the examples of Lauren Daigle versus David, we, right away you would say, oh, what she did isn't nearly as bad as David, right? Because in our minds, we have a scale. <laughs> God's sitting there going, what I care about is who you are in your heart. That's what I care about. You're going to keep screwing up. These things are going to happen. You're, you, trust me, you're not going to leave this room today, and all of a sudden, you stop doing things that God says you shouldn't do. It's going to keep happening. It's how you respond to that, your character as a person. God delights in that. And just like in a child, he tries to correct we got to think of that in our culture when we're talking to non-believers. What I like to say all the time is, no, that makes total sense what Bill and I say. I, I totally get it. I agree. What else would a non-believer say? <laughs> what else are they going to say? Oh, yeah, gosh, you guys are right. You know, without a doubt, the Bible's true. No, I expect this because the only way we know, how do we know? How do we have knowledge now where we're sitting? Is it from studying the evidence? It's from the belief. It's from the faith. The Holy Spirit did something. The Holy Spirit came in and opened our eyes for some crazy reason. The Holy Spirit opened my eyes and now I see things that are crystal clear. I look at Kinesit in that example, walking along on a microtubule in the cell, and my first thought is, of course that's designed. A non-believer looks at that and goes, no, that doesn't convince me of anything. You know why I know it's obvious? God's opened my eyes. So when I'm surrounded by non-believers, they're going to act the way they act. Until God gets a hold of someone, it's not going to matter. Does that make sense? He's annoying, isn't he? God's kind of annoying. Why does he do that? Why did he say, Genesis 1-1, I created? You know why? Because when you look at the universal expansion law, you can see by the formulas of mathematics, like he doesn't do that. He just says, it is the way it is, so believe me. All right, guys, so Kevin and I finish up. Let's close in prayer, and then we will see you next week. Father, thank you.